They do? How much is it? $229. Is it the same one? I don't know. What's See? the same? Shiny. <laughs> yeah. No, there there are some they look the same but they aren't the same. Well, I don't know, I so, I mean the one I'm buying is the best one. There have been some. I can usually tell if the platter toolkit looks like it has a lid on the top. If it has a lid on the top, it's the bad one. It's it's a terrible one. So, I just looked at it real quick. I've only been buying the Salvation Data ones. I haven't been buying any of the cuz I bought them to test them to see if I could get the price down and they've all been shit. They've all been terrible. Yeah, and probably, probably in that price range. I'm going to say it's probably one, not. If it looks like it has a top to it, it's shit. It's terrible. So that's the one that, uh, right, the don't. One that yeah, price. don't. Yeah. <clears throat> don't buy that one. Trust me. It, it, just, it just isn't worth the money from that standpoint. I mean, I'll show you as we're going through stuff. There's other ways to do it. Don't you, most of these drives you could do with scotch tape. You don't even need the bench. I mean, the bench certainly helps in a professional environment. It does help to have it lined up, held together, do the whole thing. I can, I can do it with scotch tape. Have you done the scotch tape trick? So I'll, I'll show you as we're going through it, as we get through the process. Um, one last thing. When you said the clean room, I found one for $238, the same one that you said for $230 on eBay. The Baker Company Electronic uh, Hard Drive Clean Bench. Yes. Edgar. Let me see it. IV 22 Flow. <laughs> Oh, on eBay, yeah. Right, and uh, it smells like mechanically yeah. separated chicken. Well, but uh, <laughs> kind of hard to, you know, kind of hard to <laughs> smell it from here. Yeah. So, so, so it's in Orlando, so you have to go see it in Orlando. Those are the things you have to see physically. Yes. Yeah. Well, most of the time they won't ship them either. Most of the time you have to pick them up. You can buy a complete plexiglass one, brand new, for about a grand. So it has a a top hood, plexiglass, you can build it out, you can fold it up, you can take it with you kind of thing, but it has like a, a base and plexiglass all around and a hood on the top. So, um, you know, worst, that's the worst case scenario. Uh, otherwise, you know, if you want like a full giant, you know, I love my cabinet, it's great, but you can't move it. It's 600 pounds, can't move it. I have to call a moving crew to move it. What, the one you showed the picture? Yeah, the one I have. 600 pounds? Yeah, 600 pounds. I know it doesn't look like it, but it's 600 pounds. And it doesn't come with legs. So you have to get a table that can hold 600 pounds. So you, you're not using these tables, I can tell you that. It's like, <laughs> gone. Uh, no, I actually went to Home Depot and bought one of those workbenches that you would normally use and put that underneath it. And so mine's sitting on top of that on two by four legs on a workbench that you never see because it's completely covered. All right, so... Uh, so I mean, there's a couple of pages in there and stuff that we've kind of already talked about. So I want to jump ahead just to kind of get to page 214. So let's go up to 214. Let's finish this, and then we're going to start skipping right into hard drives and get through some stuff. <clears throat> On page 214 in book one, and read those pages later, just a couple. I mean, most of the stuff you've, we've already talked about, smart, and, you know, just basically that we're getting to imaging. Don't use check disk. Don't use spin write. So, uh, and some of the things you can do with SMART. But one of the things I want to point out about SMART that's pretty important. So, somewhere on your platters, there is a system area. It may be on the outside edge. It may be here in the middle. It can be on one side of one platter. It could be on the other side. There can be two on one side of the platter. There's, the manufacturer can choose whatever they want. Inside the system area is where you will find the majority of the data that is the, use the, the identifiable parts of the drive. So model number, serial numbers, um, geometry, most of the things that need or require storage. With one exception, there are some pieces of data that are stored in a ROM. So on hard drives, a lot of hard drives are bored like this, there may be a little flash drive that's on the board. So there will be a little 8-pin chip that's on the board and that stores, normally it's a couple of tables up to about four tables. And normally it stores content in there that is necessary for you to move that is unique for your drive. One of the tables is about heads. It has your head measurements in it. So a head on a drive has a measurement between point A and point B when you are building a head. So when they are making it and assembling it at manufacturing time, they have measured the distance 
from the read-write components of the head and included that measurement in here and they have an algorithm that basically realigns where the head should move, how much it should be moving with the voice coil against the board with its algorithm for the unique head that you have and zone tables and other things like that. So a lot of times you have to desolder this chip and take it with you. The other, so that's mostly the unique component that's on the board. Everything else that's on the board generally has nothing to do with this drive. You could use any board that is the same board from another drive by resoldering the ROM and moving it to the board you have. Okay? So that, you know, we don't fix boards. We barely ever try to find what's wrong with the board and fix it because there's only two things that are ever wrong. One, something is burnt on the board, we don't know what it is, and so we're going to take that ROM and move it to something else that works. Or B, we have what's called a transient voltage suppressor. So there's TVSs that are on the board, they're fuses. They're the opposite of a fuse. So when they fry, they don't open up, they burn. So basically it causes a short. So when power is applied, it'll just cause a short. So if there is a transient voltage suppressor on there and it fries, and this board doesn't have one, um, a lot of drives today have them. So, so it's pretty common to see them. Like here is a Seagate. Here's a Seagate drive. Back here towards the power, might be a little hard to see, I'll pass it around a second. Back here towards the power, here's your SATA power right here. The short one is, is the one that you're using for your communication. The other one is for power. And there are two big giant black dots here. So this one, the big one, is 12 volts. The small one is 5 volts. So when one of them burns, then it causes a short, so then nothing comes on on the drive. So if your power supply goes bad or a brownout or a short happens, it'll fry that, and then nothing will work. And you'll get complete dead silence. When you power it on, you won't hear anything. It does not, because it stops right there at the power. It doesn't go any further than that. So those are good days. When I plug in a drive, it comes in, and I hear nothing. That's usually a pretty good sign. Then immediately I look for transient voltage suppressors. Now, if the concept is this drive is never going back to the client as a usable drive. It's never going back as a usable drive. Okay, I'll give it back. I give them back to the client every time. I just don't give it back and say this is a usable drive. This is a bad drive. Something happened to this drive. Buy a new drive. It's $40. Get a new drive and we will move on from there. Okay? So this drive in my possession is open for me to do anything to it as long as I can recover that data. So the very first thing, now, you can take a lot of time, you can, you know, look this over, you can figure out what you want to do as far as the transient voltage suppressor does. You can rip them off, you can replace them, you can resolder ones, you can do whatever you want to do. <clears throat> I have pictures in the book uh, coming up here. But that's the only thing that we're normally doing to repair. So let me continue on with the story I originally had and we'll get back to that. <clears throat> the rest of the stuff is the system area. So almost always, the, the, so there may be a seed value that the board has. Like it may have a name, like the family name, um, like Sabre or something like that. And it combines that content with content from the system area to provide you with your model number, your serial number, your geometry, like it combines all that material, but you're reading that from the table. So the important thing is, and we'll get back to this part later, but the important thing is in the system area, you are reading something that then you can see in your system that you know is work, your drive is working or it's not working. If I went and powered up the deep spar and I can see my source drive, but it doesn't say, it just says Toshiba, and it doesn't have a model number, it didn't read the system area. If it doesn't have geometry, it didn't read the system area. Does that make sense to everybody? So there's a lot of tables in here that give you that kind of information. Uh, serial number, model number, the P list and the G list are coming from the system area. So anything that's unique to that drive. Um, smart data comes from the system area. The one that I don't have up here is the HPA. The content for the HPA for the size and the geometry of the disk comes from the system area. So also, for forensics people, keep in mind, when you change the HPA so that you can image a hard drive, did you change content on the hard drive? You did. So you actually made changes too. It's in the system area, it's not the user area, but could it be called the user area? I can put any number in it I want. So if I wanted to transport a hard drive and I wanted to, the, you know, I'm a terrorist and I want it to be 
OK or cancel, I'm going to have a word for OK and a word for cancel in numeric values, and I can put that in the HPA and transport that over the board. Not that I needed to do it that way. I can just say OK, but nonetheless, it's like you get the point, right? I mean, I could transport something. So, uh, and then security, the passwords, those are in the system area. So, so there are some tricks you can do to trick the drives. So you can do other stuff. So anyway, so smart bean there tells you a lot. Now we're going to get into imaging, but I do want to say USB is kind of bad. Now USB 3 is different than most of the time that you're using USB. USB 3 has a protocol which you can do data recovery over, but as a device and plugging it in to try to do a data recovery or using software on your computer, it's a terrible device. I personally would say don't use USB for recovery. If you have a drive that is USB only, then these tools that we're using have advanced protocols to talk to those drives, but otherwise just plug it into a laptop and trying to do a recovery generally doesn't work. You already know that, right? And a lot of people forgot that. A lot of people forgot, oh, I got a laptop and this hard drive went bad. Let's just plug it into a connector and plug it into my laptop and let's try to do a recovery. That may, that's why everybody failed before they ever got here. Like, that's, that's failure. You cannot do recovery. I'm going to say, we may use it on the back end after a drive is good. But when you're going through your system's USB port, what is one thing that has to happen for you to talk to that through a USB port? What do you have to have on your system? Driver. A driver. It requires a driver. So that means no matter what you do, you are talking through the operating system at its limitations. So if it says 600 milliseconds, I time out, forget about you. That's what happens. So that's why they fail. You have no real control. So as a whole, you don't have the full ATA command set. You can't talk to the chipset. And unless you're in a certain category where somebody's made a USB 3 device, all the other stuff is going to fail. Okay? So USB sucks. Yep. ESAT. Like, uh, ESAT is fine. ESAT is exactly the same as SATA, just the connector is someplace else. Right? And if you want to make it work on a laptop, it does work. I've done all the tests with all the stuff through eSATA on a laptop with an eSATA port. Works fine. As a matter of fact, Victoria will actually work really well even through that port as well. Yep. There's USB only ones. You can get a board that's a SATA board and then, and then the launcher board onto that. Yes. Yeah, for, uh, for the ones that are USB. Yeah. There's still, there still are some that are that way, but we my understanding is right now, from what I have been told by manufacturers, we are at the precipice of never seeing the chipset on the board anymore. The, the chipset, because the chipset's there, and so they're just swapping between connectors. My understanding is the SATA chipset is going away, and they won't even have the chipset on the board anymore. They won't have the USB soldered without the control mechanism. Because right now we can break the board. Right now we can also, uh, so if you have like a Western Digital Drive, you can break capacitors. There's four little capacitors. You can break them. You can solder four wires. You can connect your SATA connector to it. And you can pretend your USB drive is now a SATA drive. You can now connect them straight up because the controller is still there. But my understanding is they're taking that ability away from us. And then we will only be left with one of these higher end three tools that can only do USB. As of today, though, that's not a problem for you. As of today, you can break something. I'm not going to tell you. It's annoying as crap. I had to do it for, you have to do it for like the first two years that we did data recovery that there was no tool that would address the USB port. Um, we had to do it manually. Huh? Couldn't do anything else. Yeah, couldn't do anything else. That was all you had. You had, if you wanted to work on DeepStar, you had to re-solder all those wires and spend half a day getting everything working again so that you could put it back on your DeepStar. And, and personally, it does function better than it does over USB, even with the USB boards. That's my opinion, that putting a SATA port on the drive works better than the USB solution. But, I'll, but you know, I'm about speed also. If it works when I plug it in through USB, great. If it doesn't, then I still have to solder the connector on. Does that make sense? And you're finding actual boards, like you're finding like Toshiba boards and stuff that you can replace, right? That's the ones you're talking about. And so you can find one that still has a SATA. Like some of the same families with the same drives came in both editions, a SATA and a USB. And you can take that one off and move it to the other one. So, and you're moving the ROM, right? Yeah. <clears throat> so, so anyway, so again, I mean, you can even find some cheap solutions and do some other boards and things. I already mentioned also running in reverse basically gets rid of the cache. There is a, the tools will let us turn them off, 
but if you were saying in a Linux environment and you run DD rescue backwards, basically that can solve some problems because you're turning off the cache per se. It's not really off, but, and this is all the words that I just said, <coughs> okay? We've done most of that. <coughs> now let me hop into what would be day two, which picks up at page uh, 230, 232. So we're a little bit behind. We've had a lot of discussions, but they're good discussions. And we would have had them anyway, sooner or later. <coughs> All right, so I'm going to kind of go through this quickly, and then we'll go back over it again on Thursday. Because we're going to keep plugging through this whole process. We're going to go through... Uh, this basic process of imaging, this is mostly what we're about to focus on today, is this part right here. And for today, yeah, I'm going to mention, I'm going to talk about the diagnostic stage, but here's the thing that's going to happen to us. You're going to disassemble the drive, and then you're going to try to recover data from that drive. And we're not really doing a lot of diagnostics because we're starting with a good drive. We break a drive, then we're going to recover the drive. So what happened to the drive? You messed it up. So it's not like we're going to have like a random like um, unless you fry a board or you do something else. But the whole point is to get this process down. You've got to start with a known good condition, repair your known good condition. Then you can learn how to deal with what it's supposed to look like. When I buy something, I always buy two of them so that I know what this one's supposed to look like when I think this one is wrong. Does that make sense to everybody? I always buy two of almost everything. So this is the process we're about to go through. Uh, so let's talk about from a diagnostic perspective. Now on the thumb drive, which I can pass around or when we start labs, we'll pass around. You guys can start copying this. The, there's a PDF of this. It's not a perfect, it's not a perfect uh, analysis of hard drive stuff. I know it's hard to read in the book, so I kind of blew it up. And the PDF is in color on here, so you'll be able to read it. <clears throat> um, it's not perfect. It's a pretty good run through really quick of the concepts of well, here's, here's what we're going to troubleshoot. What kind of problem do we have? It's not so much about the problems that exist. It's the problems that, are, um, that fall out of the norm. Like, for instance, when the Seagate drive that has this bug we were talking about earlier from 2008, when it has this bug that kicks in, what does it sound like and what does it do? That's different than what other drives sound like normally when they have a problem. So it falls out of the normal category. So... Let's start with the beginning of this. Now, you guys have seen me do this a couple of times. Does a drive come ready? What I mean by that is what you've seen happen on the deep spar happens on every diagnostics tool. Uh, on every diagnostics tool somewhere, there is a process across the top right here, drive seat complete, drive ready. So almost every single tool has a status display. And so if I turn the drive off, so I hit F12, F12 is how you turn a drive off on a deep spar. So remember this because you're going to need it. F12 turns it off. F11 turns it on. That's how you turn off and on a drive. The drive that is connected to the top of the deep spar is controlled by power. Not the one connected to the side, which is what you're writing to. Okay? That one's controlled by the machine. So when I hit F11 and turn it on, power is going through the top of the board and then it is then passing to the drive. The drive is initializing the system area. It goes from busy to drive seat complete, drive ready. That's what we're looking for every time, okay? Normally, you would be on this screen because you've disassembled a drive, you're reassembling a drive, and you're trying to get it to work, right? So I'd be on this screen, and until this source drive came up, I can't read anything. So I would constantly be making changes to the head assembly, turn it off, turn it back on, drive seat complete, drive ready. If those two lights don't come up, and sometimes they do automatically when you refresh, because sometimes it's a screen refresh problem, but when you hit R, it refreshes the screen and pulls this whole chain. So until I see drive seat complete, drive ready, and then model number, serial number, and geometry, nothing's going to work. If you don't get past that, there's very rare instances, 1% of a chance that you can do something that's a bug that you can get past. But the rest of the time, you have to see this. Does this make sense? There's also a hidden command menu that they don't point out to you on this screen, and it's F9. On a deep spar, F9 brings up this new menu where they've been gradually adding bug fixes. 
So things that are like firmware fixes, quick fixes to get the drive running again. So you can hit F9, it's not documented on that screen, and F9 will bring up these things. So like for instance on the Western Digital, you can decide which head you want on, which head you want off. Um, there is a slow responding problem you can apply, clears the table, uh, G-list problem, you know what the G-list is, right? The bad block table. Sometimes when it gets corrupt, it causes the machine to hang, or to achieve is to hang, you can clear them. Clear smart, because that gets corrupt. <clears throat> so they've been gradually adding stuff to this list. I don't have the newest updates, but they gradually add stuff. So just keep that in mind that that's an undocumented key that it's, it is somewhere on one of the other menus, but, uh, but at least from that standpoint, that's what we're looking for. We're looking for drive seat complete, drive ready, and the source information. Good? What's the shortcut for that screen? Uh, so it will be the first one when the deep start comes up, but it is Alt I. Hang on. If I was here and I was going back to the beginning, it's Alt I, and it's the first one is Control D. So you can just hit Control D, and it'll take you to the Drive Select screen. <clears throat> and anytime a deep start starts out, that's where it starts out. So when you're not in the screen working on it, okay. So control D. All right, so back to this. So that's always what I'm looking for first. So in my diagnostics, that's the first thing. Then the second thing is, did I see model number, serial number, geometry? So these two, under almost every circumstance, you need to see that, okay? So those are the first things. You cannot start imaging until you have that. If it doesn't come ready, if you don't get ready and you get a busy signal in the top left-hand corner. Now, it doesn't have to be this, but one of the first things, if a drive came untouched, None of, nobody in the world touched this drive. You can tell by looking at the drive most of the time. It hasn't been opened. There's no screws. Nobody modified this drive because you guys are all going to modify your drives. So you might get busy because of something else. A head can't align. You can't get something going. So in this case, I'm looking to see, is it a Seagate F3 series? This is the ones we were talking about with the bug from 2008 and on, which still have a lot of them out there in the field. If they're those models, then, and it didn't come ready, the first thing I'm going to do is try to figure out, do I have a tool that can apply this bug patch? Because there is a bug patch for this because it won't come ready, or sometimes it'll come ready, and it'll also give you zero for the geometry. So you'll get these weird kind of errors, but that's the first thing is just accept that if it says that it's a Seagate, and it's a 7211 and later, or a Momentus.4 is one of the other models of them, if they're later than 2008, think about the bug, okay? So that's the next step. And then from there, if the motor doesn't spin, you know, if it's not a Seagate and the motor doesn't spin, now, whenever I'm thinking of diagnostics, I'm thinking of it like this. I think of it in these terms. I plug in the drive. I hear nothing, completely quiet. I'm going to look for transient voltage suppressors, okay? I'll tell you about that in a second again. The second thing is, if I hear a noise and the motor doesn't spin. So you hear like a hum or something like that. Power's going through the board, but the motor's not spinning. And you hear like a hmm, something like that. You hear a hum, you hear some other noise. You put your ear to it and it just kinda, you can hear something, but it's not spinning. A non-spinning disc, that's a pretty important thing, but it's also normally a pretty good sign. Because if, this, if the drive doesn't spin, then it's either the board is bad, something happened to the board, which is what I hope, or the second one is the motor is seized, which in both of those cases, well, you do get a different sound usually when that happens because the drive does try to spin, and you'll get a little bit more of a eh, 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 like that sound instead of a eh, like that. Like you'll get a hum on a motor that's seized. It, it doesn't because it can't move at all as opposed to the one that actually can move, but the head stuck to it. So you do get a two different sounds. And so, now if the motor is seized, so again, if it, the first thing, if it's a Western Digital, remember Western Digital has a head problem attached to the lid, right? So I try not to open Western Digitals if I can try to figure it out some other way first. Does that make sense? So I want to swap boards before I open the lid so that might require me to solder a bomb to swap a board to find out. But I'm going to try not to mess with the head assembly on a Western Digital because I don't want to cause two problems. Right? Everybody with me? 
So you can start seeing how I'm breaking this down. So number one is, let's, let's screw around with the board. I can take this on all day long, take it on, off, screw around with it, as long as you don't like fry it or do anything. And they're pretty durable. They're pretty durable boards as a whole. Um, Resoldering ROM is about the only thing that you have to worry about. You can do it in a minute and a half to two minutes with infrared. It's literally like this. Can you do it with a firmware tool? Yes. You can plug it into a firmware tool. You can download the chip, copy it back, and overwrite a chip. There's still more of a chance you can mess that up than soldering. The soldering is so quick and easy, I don't even bother anymore to try to do it with a firmware tool or erase something or cause some other problem. And there are times where when the board's bad, it's too bad to read the chipset from the tool, even though it can read and copy it and basically becomes a ROM burner. But soldering works every time. Soldering always works. And with infrared, it's so quick and easy, I don't bother to do anything else. And you'll agree with me after Thursday, I promise. After Thursday, if you can do it in 15 minutes, trust me, you do it a couple of times, you'll be done in a minute and a half, two minutes. It will take no time at all. All right, so next. So if, if I hear nothing and it's not spinning, then board, motor, right? Those are what you're looking at. So if it's Western Digital, don't open it till you play with your board. Then you can worry about the motor. If it is the motor, you're going to have to open the drive anyway. If it's seized, you're going to have to open it, and you're going to have to disassemble it, and you're going to end up doing what we're going to do the rest of the day. Good? Okay. If it is the motor, under any other circumstance, it's okay to open the lid. I can open the lid on a Seagate hard drive and not have a problem, and I can take a... a, a Usually I use my tweezers, I put it in one of the screws, you, you will get good enough that you're not careful enough, you won't scratch your assembly, and see if it turns. If it turns and it's working, it's probably going to work, and it means there's something else going on. But I'll almost always mess with the board first. You don't even need the same exact type of board to test a motor to see if it works. All you need to do is cover up the pins that connect. Underneath this board, there's a couple of wires that connect to the motor for power. Could you jerry-rig something so that you could have a little test set? Yes. But why bother? You have boards. All you need to do is put a post-it note over the head, head assembly pins. There's head assembly pins that are going to connect to this board. All you need to do, unscrew a board, get another board that looks like this board, put a post-it note over it, screw that board on, and if you knew that board was working on another drive, when you apply power, if the motor's going to spin, it's going to spin. Everybody good? If that spins and it did not spin before, your problem's a board. Now you've got to find the right board, and then you've got to resolder the ROM. Okay? So I can test it with just ordinary boards. Everybody happy? All right. So now as we're stepping through this, um, you know, as a whole, you know, do you hear sounds? What does the sound sound like? Is it scraping? Blah, blah, blah. And so before I buy a donor drive, I'm usually going to check to see how much damage there is on the platter. So if I haven't opened it, none of these things work, even if it's a Western Digital, I'm going to be like, before I spend any money, let's open it up and let's see how bad. Now, there are ways I can look without opening it up. There's Western Digitals have silver down the side. So a Western Digital drive normally has like a s opening, like a little, s they used it for, during the manufacturing process to align head assemblies. There's one there, and there's one underneath this board that goes across the bottom of the drive. So I can take these off, I can peel those back and see if there's any damage without removing the lid. Does that make sense to everybody? If there's a lot of powder and dust there, that's your drive, that's your data. So it's up to you to determine how much you want to do as far as a donor drive. As soon as you have scraped platters, your success rate goes down. I tell the client that. I pass on the donor drive cost. So my fixed $800 cost does not include donor drives. It used to, but now when they're one terabyte, or whatever, you know, four terabytes, your expenses can be more than the drive, than, than you getting paid. So it's 800 plus donor drive if necessary, plus shipping or whatever else. So I'll tell the client, I say, look, I found this on donordrives.com. You can even go see it yourself if you want. I only charge 5% for all the fees that I have to pay along the way. And we search for drives for free. We're not charging for that. So we'll find a drive, send it to the client, say, all right, this donor drive is pretty expensive. It's $183, and if you, you know, want to find a cheaper one, let me know. We'll wait, and we'll keep searching. Otherwise, if you want your data recovered quicker, you know, here's a donor drive. We think it's only got about a 40% chance it's going to work because you've got head damage and platter damage, and it's scraped. So we may be able to get your data, but it may not be all of it. 
and we've only got a 40% chance it's even going to work or something like that. Does that make sense? So that way the client knows and their expectations are set. It really honestly, as in all businesses, setting your client's expectations are pretty important to whether or not they're satisfied with you or not. If you don't communicate with them and you don't set their expectations and they just, oh yeah, we've got a great chance, we're going to get this and maybe it'll be a 99% recovery, they're going to expect that. They don't understand anything's wrong and they're going to be pissed off they paid you $183 for a drive and then you couldn't get it. Right? They don't understand that's a hard cost. You actually paid for that. And they'll argue with the credit card company and you will lose. Okay? All right. So, so that process. Now, so here's the thing. Platter is scraped. What caused it? Head. So does it matter if the head was damaged or if the platter was damaged? Both of them are damaged, right? In most cases, in my experience, like 85% of the time, if you've got platter damage, you've got head damage, or you've at least got a head that's so bad it may not work, if you could not have already initialized it on the system, turned off a head, and read it. Because I would still try that. I would still hook it up. If it's running well enough to initialize, I'm going to image it by turning off a head and then go back and deal with the one bad head later. Everybody understand that that's a different scenario. Then I can't tell what's wrong with this drive and now where are we going from the beginning of the steps. Okay? So, <clears throat> in the process of doing that, it's really important to you know, kind of at least rate how badly damaged it is. You're going to be pulling heads off. There's a lot of times I might have to use two heads if the platter's really damaged. So I may need two donor drives. So because as soon as you get to the spot where the damage is, the head gets damaged again. And then you'll, you'll need something to finish the drive. So sometimes I have to have two. I give the client the option. We tried this one donor drive. I got 20% of the drive. I was able to cover, recover some sectors. The head is now damaged, and I'm going to need another head in order to make this work. Here is another donor drive. We, you know, we were able to read some of this, so maybe we'll be able to read the rest of it. We, we've got a 30% chance or whatever. Okay? Is there any kind of guidelines for the kind of dust that you can see in there that it would be? Because, like, I mean, for me, working on transmission, if I get, you know, really, really fine stuff around the drain plug is one thing as opposed to big chips and chunks. No, um, any dust is bad. Any of it, usually what happens, especially on Hitachi drives, when one side scratches, the dust comes out, gets underneath the head on the other side, and then that side starts scratching the other side. So on most drives, I only see platter damage on one side most of the time. Um, but no, there's not really a good rating for that. Uh, if the other platters look good, as best you can see, then maybe you have a chance. That's as good as it gets. You try like a vacuum up. If, if you're going to clean it, vacuum it's not going to solve the problem. I would end up using HFE 7100. I'd run it through one time, take it out, and then try to go from there. Yeah, I, you don't have to if it's, if it's a good clean assembly from that standpoint. But I, your head is probably damaged. The first head's probably damaged. So I would probably do that. I would probably still have disassembled the drive. I would have put it in there, washed it one time, take it out, put a new set of heads in, and then see if I could read anything. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. So we're adding all these things together one at a time to try to figure that out. I would probably reuse the previous stuff that I had used that had already been filtered on that drive rather than a brand new bottle of that because it's not been in a fire, it's not been in water. I'm just rinsing it off. Okay. <clears throat> um, so as we're stepping through that, that's kind of the main, the main list of the pieces and then until you hit the hard stuff. You know, you've got to do a platter rebuild. If you have head damage and platter damage, almost always it's, there's no firmware damage. It's probably not board damage. It's probably not a motor. It's head and platters hit each other, which I will tell you is about 15% mm, of the drives. 15%, I would say. I would say... 80 to 85 percent of drives that come through the door untouched by anyone if no one touched them because that's the problem once they've been filtered by anyone else all the good ones were filtered out and if you said what comes from those people from then on those people are only giving you bad shit <laughs> you understand like those guys are good enough they took all the good drives so they got 85 percent of the drives they've got 15 or 20 percent of the drives that they send you those 15 or 20 were all the bad ones. So that means if you break it down, 85, uh, you go someplace, go into a building, give me all your bad drives. 
85 of those out of every 100 are going to be drives that have bad sectors, something else was wrong, or a simple board problem I can fix, and I could read 85 of those on a deep spar with probably no other equipment. Okay? 15% is going to be broken down into <clears throat> 2 to 3% bad motors seized, right? 5% firmware problems. Somewhere between 3 and 5% are firmware problems, which you cannot easily see or fix, and those are your most expensive and hardest ones to fix. Those, that last 5% is going to be the spot where you're going to be like, do I get a PC3000 someday? When you get to that spot, when you recognize it, that's when that day starts forward. Because those will be the firmware, those will be, but I will tell you 95% of all drives I can fix without a PC3000. 95% of everything that comes through the door is a manual, somehow intervened problem. Okay? And then, so, so those are the only ones you can't see, is the firmware. The rest of them, it's all physical problems. That other 95% is all physical in some way. So either I'm putting it on a deep spar after I've repaired something, I get sectors back, I'm doing a board repair, I'm doing a head repair, I'm doing a motor replacement. Those are all the things. So when you're looking down the list, We've talked about drive seat complete, drive ready. This is MHDD. This is a free tool you can get to the spot that we're talking about at this point. Drive seat complete, drive ready. So these are the five pieces that you must see or you cannot image a drive. You must be able to see drive seat complete, drive ready, serial number, model number, geometry. If you do not get those numbers, you cannot image a drive, period. Okay? We'll go over this again on Thursday. I'm going to hit it really fast. This is a sector. A sector is not 512 bytes, it's actually about 591 bytes. So in that range of 591 bytes, these are the groups of things that are identified. Your 512 bytes that is just your data is just this one piece right here. The rest of this stuff is all addressing and ECC and tracking and fixing things. Every time you run into an error in one of these groups of things, they have a specific error that it shows you. Now, here's the amazing thing. All this expensive uh, forensic software that some of us have paid for over the years, like InCase, they could not do something like simply tell me why that sector had an error. Because they're not tracking any of this stuff. They're not, they don't have the interface. They don't know what they're doing. Atola does, but does Tableau? No idea at all. You know why? Because they use DD and they just copied the drive. They don't know why it's bad. So they, the drive actually tells you what's wrong with it. It actually has identifying characteristics. And so if I can't find this, it'll be ID not found. If I can't find the part that says, hey, I've got 512 bytes. I'm about to give you 512 bytes. Ready, go. That's called address marker not found. It will not find the address marker. Then you have ECC, which is, I had a problem reading the 512 bytes because there was no other way for me to do this, but it doesn't match ECC. Did I have an error? Error correcting code will flash and it'll basically abort. So it'll then abort. If it cannot read it beyond the threshold, it will actually have an uncorrectable error and it will tell you it's uncorrectable because it has no way of determining it. You can turn that off and you can read it. We're going to go through that part again. I just want everybody to know. Then when you get to the second part, it's, oh, this sector was so bad, I couldn't use it anymore. So I have two different ways I can make a bad block. So and there's three if you combine them. And it has an address marker that says, I'm no longer here. I am now reallocated, and I am in the system area. So now there is an area where the second part is stored someplace else and there's a pointer to it and the pointer is done two different ways one can be written in the sector one can be written in a in a table in the system area those are and then you can combine those two so that's your bad block okay yes that'd be that would be the g list the g list it'd be it'd be a function of the g list the content of the g list so in other words the con the g list has the flag the pointer the content sits in the system area also in a separate place. So there's two places, G list and where the data is. Okay? Yep. This is all filtered out before it gets to the OS, right? You're just getting back to right. the flow. This is all hardware. Right. Yep, this is all hardware. OS knows nothing. So, uh, so th there are error codes. I wrote them all down, I backed them up, I, you know, so you'll know what they are. So let's get into the diagnostics. There's the, I just went through this. You can have a board problem. 
a motor problem, head and platter damage, which go hand in hand, and firmware. Now, firmware is its own set of 9,000 things. So, and basically it means you're going to live in a hex editor. You're going to export content from a drive. You're going to try to repair it, cut and paste, do stuff. They've got some automatic tools now, but when I started out, there was nothing automatic, so you did everything by hand. So even in PC3000, you export your tables, you manually edit them, you put them back together, write them back to the drive. So, so as we're going through this process, these are the exceptions. Seagate, as we already have been talking about, 7211. If you see any of these numbers and any of these things later, or the date is past 2008, well, you probably have one of the bugs. Especially if it says busy, drive C complete doesn't come up already, and you're, or you get zero. And not that it can't be a head problem. It can also be a head problem. But I would try to do a bug fix first. Now, I did write, a student actually wrote, a free way to do the bug repair. So there is a patch, you, and there is an ISO. The ISO for the patch is on here. So when I pass this around, you can copy this. And there's instructions in the book. I'm not going to go over every single thing. It's way easier to do it if you have a tool that will do it for you. But in the book, if you look, first you need the cable. First you need, you either need a standard serial cable. This is a TTL to RS-232 cable. And you can buy them online for 20 bucks. And then you take that, you plug it in, you do a couple of steps, you have a certain place. If you buy this cable that I pointed to, you can, you can put the orange wire and the yellow wire here. And then you can follow using a terminal command in the book on page 253. If you read those steps from 253 to 254, you can actually repair the drive from the firmware bug for free. This is what we used to have to have. Like we had no solution for like two years of how to do it, or six months. It was six or seven months. Um, ironically, Salvation Data came out with the bug fix first, which kills me, crushes me. But it wasn't but a couple of days later before PC3000 had it. And like I said, PC3000, like he mentioned earlier, this is the one where you put the business card in, you short the board, and then you pop it back out, and then you write something to the disk, and then it works. And that's what we're doing here is it's a patch and there is a way to patch it. And these steps work. I know many people who have done them. It was written by a student, and he did them, uh, and it has worked many times for people, and the ISO, the patch, is on here. Okay? All right, so that's number one. Moving on from there. Now, terminal, Seagate hard drives all have a terminal interface that you can connect to them. Now, they have recently been trying to lock them. I did get notice yesterday from PC3000, from ACE Laboratories, that they have cracked the new LM series. Yep. So yesterday I got a notice last night when I got home that uh, Ace Laboratories, the one I mentioned yesterday, that the firmware was locked. If I understood, sometimes they don't write their release notes right, and I think something else happened than what I thought happened, but they said the LM series now is unlocked in the update. Yep. Right. Yesterday they said they released it. So, uh, so maybe... What I said yesterday no longer matters, as long as you have PC3000, right? You can get around the firmware problem. Stuff is obsolete. Right. <laughs> hey, from yesterday to today. And hey, that is actually my life. That is actually how you should get used to your life being. So, and eventually one day when we finally get new file systems, that's how it's going to feel again. Um, all right, so anyway, there is a serial cable you can connect to almost every Seagate hard drive, and you can plug it into a terminal, and you can apply commands. Guess what else I have on here? Somehow, we got a hold of the command documents for Seagate hard drives for all the ones, all the ones prior to the 7211. So everything that was 7210 back to the origination of time of hard drives, we have all the commands. And somehow, they've never told me not to distribute it. I don't know how that's ever happened. But one day they're going to tell me, and then I can no longer give it away. But right now, there is a Seagate command guide that is on here and has all of the commands for all of their hand, for all of their stuff by prompt before 7211. 7211 and later, we haven't figured them all out. We don't have them all. So, so gradually we're making our way through that. Okay? Um, there also are some situations where there are bugs. Like, for instance, uh, if you're in terminal and you can see something like this, generally you end up with a situation where your head is not working, and not only one head, but all of the heads are not responding. 
So you end up in a situation where you are replacing a set of heads. Now in a situation like this one, now if you're looking at this screen, and let's just say no matter what you do, uh, no matter what you do, so brown means I did not copy them. They timed out. Green means I copied them. Okay? You guys seen something like this so far, right? Now, I'm copying 120 blocks at a time. You can tell I'm at 240 errors. I got an error, so it's, and I just know the default is 120. So it's doing 120 blocks at a time. So this is one read. Then this is the second read. Then this is the third read. Then this is the fourth read. Is this a head error? Is the heads bad? It's consistent. Now don't confuse it with the previous one that we did yesterday that was the uh, media, reading all the way across the media, and that we had the red rows, right? Because it looks a little similar, but it's not quite. What's the difference between this and the one that I did yesterday afternoon? These are pins. After you left, I think. I saw the video. The media reader with the red block. Well, good. I'm glad you watched it all. Okay. What's the difference between this and that? So, how is data stored on a hard drive when Well, well, well yes, but it's stored in huh? zones. Stored in zones, right? So you have a contiguous block of say 2 gigs before you move on to the other 2 gigs. So that big? Yes. At least in many cases, yes. In in the book there's also a picture of them back to back and there was one that was six gigs before it even moved on to the next zone. So they're they're there. But so if I read that and I didn't read this, is that enough space in between this read and that read for that to be a different head? And then this one? No, it's not. No matter what I do in this situation, every other block will not be copied. No matter what I do. So, in other words, if I made this one sector size instead of 120, every one sector would copy, the second one wouldn't. Then one would copy, then one wouldn't. This is not a head error because this is the same head. No matter what, you can't be outside the scope of this one head in this amount of space. Does that make sense? So, so it wouldn't be a chunk and then another chunk. I would actually, if it was a bad head, I wouldn't be able to read any of this. It would all be brown or a board or something else. Everybody with me? Mm -hmm. So if you saw something like this, and let's just say I adjust the size. Let's say I adjusted it to 40 and 40. So it would read 40 and skip 40, then read 40 and skip 40. Forever and ever. It turns out what happened is Seagate in their first line of 7200, uh, in this case these are, th these are uh, these are the first 750, these are the first perpendicular drives. That's where this started, is the first 750 gigs. So these perpendicular, 2006. From then on there was a bug. It's called a pending bug. What happens is the head is searching for bad sectors. It's only supposed to do it during idle times. Something went crazy and it does it now while it's in use. So what happens is it's actually using the CPU every other cycle. So the first cycle it reads, the second cycle, the CPU is busy on the drive, so it skips the next block because there's not enough time to read it. Then it reads the next one. So it gets every other time cycle forever, no matter what you do. So think about this. If it's 750 gigs and from the beginning to the end, I could only ever read every other read. 375? It's what? It'd be half the size 375 gigs. Yes, for the first time you'll read 375, then the second time you read, you'll read, yeah, you'll, you'll gradually whittle away at it. But it takes about 17 months to read this drive. Because no matter what, you're always going to be one away, right? Until you finally get it. So, so uh, PC3000 did come out with a bug fix for the pending bug. Basically what it does is it just kills that cycle. It does not fix it permanently. It only fixes it while it's connected to the PC3000. 
it, it downloads the code, changes it, re-injects it back into memory, and then says turn off this feature. Then you can copy the drive just fine. But How do if, you think it released? Good question. That's insane. Question. It is. And can you imagine all the times that manufacturers have gotten away with failures in the hard drive that people out there don't know anything about, it's not their fault, and that their drive didn't work and paid for recovery or did something else? Where's the class action? Right. How, but how do you know what happened? Well, you know. I know. Do you think that the, let's say, let's say in the world, there's 3,000 data recovery companies. Out of those 3,000, how many of us are going to be spending the time going to court to fight Seagate? And explain this to you. Well, 25% on the collection. Plus we make money. Hey, we're making money. Right. We bought that tool. We turned it off. We fixed it. Money walks in the door. <laughs> I'm going to get into the data recovery biz just to file class action tonight because I can find class rep very easily. This was, this was good business. <laughs> it's going to be better for me. I'm going to take it in one chunk. You can send it back and I'll just give you a brand new one. It's a love hate relationship. Well, for you, they give you a new one. They don't give us new ones. <laughs> yeah, we get, we get refurbished. Right, but, but what about the data that was on it? The data is what matters. <laughs> the data is what mattered. Nobody else cared about any of the other stuff. The data is what mattered. But here's the thing. If you saw this on a deep spar, you can't fix this on a deep spar. No firmware tool. Right. You, you have to have a friend. Phone a friend. That's the best you got. Good. Right. So that's the whole point is that it's also important to know when to stop. If you saw this, you know it's not a head problem. What's well, right. You look at the platters, it's not the platters. The platters aren't scratched. And then every time you read again, it can read that one. So if you told it read 120 but start there where it didn't read, and then it reads that fine, that should be a clue in your head like, this is really weird that no matter what I do, every other one doesn't work. This is a bug. When did they fix it? Has it been patched by Seagate? Yeah, it, it, it was probably out for about a year and a half. So the massive failure was in the 2008 drives. These came out in 2006. So they fixed that bug, and then the big bug came. Well, a one. Right? So a big, better one. Well, don't buy Seagate. Seagate is, on that chart that he was talking about earlier, uh, Seagate is the big failure. <laughs> Seagate is the one that is the worst one on the list that they have of all the failures. It's the worst drive. Is that drop down now? I assume they've worked these bugs out. Oh, th this report's released yearly. Yeah, it's a blaze. It's blaze or somebody. Blaze report. Yeah, and it, it's they're like a mass storage cloud company or something, and they have all these drives. But it's called the Blaze report or something, and Seagate is always in the worst. Hitachi is always at the top. It's the best one. Yeah. All right. So no, this one you must know. Hey, start putting two and two together. This is not something you can fix without a firmware tool. So you still see this as well? It's pretty rare now. I mean, there's not a lot of 750. A lot of people have moved. Because between that time period, you're looking at 750 to 1 terabytes. After that, people move in mass droves. So it's like, oh, I've had this 500 gig for a while. Now 4 terabytes are out. And then they move straight to 4 terabyte. They don't move to these numbers in between. So they'll take all their drives, they'll take all their 500s, they'll stack them all up, they'll copy all the pictures off to their 4 terabyte, then they format, throw them away, and then that dies, and then you've got to recover from that. Right, that's what happens all at once. They just moved 27 drives to a 4 terabyte, which... And they were, you always think of what backups, because as soon as they put it for that one, they drop that one. Right. Yeah. Especially the ones, you know, those those drives for a while that they they made them look like you know like they stood on edge. Yeah. They were really pretty. They had a light. They went up and down and like that. Yeah. But then it falls off the edge of the table, and these most of the time don't even have any accelerometers or anything to stop them and turn them off in time before they hit the ground, which laptop drives norm mostly do. So when these things hit the ground then usually what happened was the motor seized and it seized and that was it so all right so this is what it looks like as it scrolls by you'll see some of these things they'll just scroll by you'll just if you were looking at them in a terminal command now terminal you can actually use like hyper terminal like the old windows hyper terminal you can hook that up 
to that cable that I showed you how to buy for 25 bucks, plug it in, set the settings, and you can actually talk to the drive. You can type command. Now, when you do, don't just start typing letters. Letters do things like, you know, a dot sends you help bits. You don't want to do like, you know, slash to, slash, you know, you don't want, you just don't want to type commands randomly. The book, the book will tell you. Okay? All right. So, just know when to stop. All right? We've been talking a lot about Western Digital. Western Digital also has a heat problem where they melt. Have you seen this in any of the drives you guys have done? The drive, the drive starts to melt the filters and the, uh, and the ramp that the heads sit in. They start to melt and then shred against the edge of the platter. And little fragments will be inside the drive. So it's a huge heat problem. And so I've been starting to take pictures of them. They dissolve fairly quickly. Like once you open them and you're inside the drive, like they just break apart because they're plastic. They just turn into dust. So just you know, keep an eye out for that kind of stuff. This little nipple on the other side of the underside of the drive, like this right here, that's what's holding the head in place. So when you remove the screw, then you no longer have alignment. There's been a couple of people who tried to make some tools that you could try to do an alignment so that you didn't have to sit there and hold the screwdriver. Because when you get it in the right place, you literally are, hold your breath and don't move. And then you image it. Or, you know, you get it to a spot where you can finally go, oh, okay. And then you can go to the bathroom while you're imaging it. But have you had to stand there and hold drives while you image them? Uh, fun, it's one of the reasons for me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, is, it is the most painful, but I've been in every situation I've been, I've had to stack pieces of foam up so that I can get it at the right angle. Sometimes it only works this way. Sometimes it works upside down. Sometimes it works when you're holding it like this. And so that's when it's really good to have a college student working for you. <laughs> Come here. Hold this. I'm going to work. Um, so, but you do literally have to hold your breath. So some people have tried to come up with jerry rigs to make that work. And, and you can do this with two pieces of plexiglass. I'll tell you this. On the bottom, there's four screws through the drive. You take a piece of plexiglass and you mount it on a table. You put those four through, screws through. You bolt that thing down. Uh, Skydog made one of these. Uh, Trevor made one of these. Uh, he made a table. And what he's got is... He, uh, he took a piece of plexiglass, put it across the top, drill a hole through there so it holds the screw in place. You can take that top piece of plexiglass and shift it around, and it'll hold that screw in place while you're doing it, and use C-clamps or something to hold it. So you can push it around till you get it right, and then you can just make minor shifts in it. So there's ways to adjust and do this. This tool was like $750, but the guy decided, hey, look, I want to be the only guy who can do Western Digital, so I'm not selling it anymore. So, you can't buy that anymore, but we can make something like it or do it. I've never felt like I really needed it, honestly. I play with the screwdriver. Eventually, we get it. When we get it, we just, you know, either hold it or we hold our breath and we walk away. One or the other. But you'll get it. You'll spend two, three hours playing with this screw. <laughs> It'll feel like you're never going to win. It will. It'll feel like you're never going to win. And, but once you know it's possible, then you just have to sit there and be persistent, okay? There are some signs, and I'll try to tell you as we're going through them, you know, there are some signs that will help you with how it... I, I will tell you honestly, one thing that's really important is for the drive to do something different than it did before. So when you're sitting there looking at the head and you're making adjustments to the screw, if the head does something different than what it did before, then that means it knows that there's data somewhere and it's trying to read it. And that means that you've at least got one head that's still good. But you'll get to a spot where you know you've replaced the head and that you've done it right and it works. So um, we're going to do the soldering on Thursday, but there's a ROM. There are also ROMs that are sometimes embedded in the chip. So in this, chi in this case, there's actually flash in the storage on this chip. And you can resolder this chip, but yeah. I just wondering, are most of the chips Marvels? I noticed all yes. of these ports. Yes, a lot of the a lot of the Western Digitals are Marvels. Yeah, a lot of a lot of them across all the drives are Marvels. Yeah. It's mostly ARM controllers. Yes, most of them. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So uh, so in when they first released this particular this is called a Western Digital Royal when these were first re released. So see this spot right here where eight pins sits. They're, those are for patches to come out. So in other words, they knew they might have a problem, and a lot of them have an empty blank spot. They can put a patch. So the data was originally in the ROM in this location. And later on, when they found a problem, they patched them, and they would 
they would solder a chip on there. If you see the chip, it is patched, and take that chip. You don't need this anymore. You don't need the content from this. If you do not see that, then the data is inside the CPU. And there, there is the